Um, uh, my name is Paula Thornhill, and on behalf of all of the student organizers of this terrific con conference on uh, civil military relations, I would like to welcome everybody back to day two. Um, if you were able to join us yesterday for day one, I think that all of you enjoyed what was a very rich um, and revealing conversation about change and continuity as we look at civil mill relations um, across administrations going back as far as the Obama and Bush administrations. Um, looking at the Trump administration and now looking forward um, to the Biden administration. Um, we have a, a terrific set of panels set up for you today. And um, after we go through our two panels, um, I will do a brief wrap up at the end of some possible takeaways um, that you might want to consider from this conversation. And with that, um, let me turn it over to our student organizers and let's just jump right into panel three. Thanks very much. All right, thank you, Dr. Thornhill. And welcome to civil military relations at the senior level. This is part of the SICE Merrill Center and Duke Program in American Grand Strategies Conference on civil military relations, which is supported by the America in the World Consortium. I'm Marissa Shannon. I'm a second year strategic studies student at SICE, and I'm joined here tonight by three distinguished speakers. We have Suzanne Nielsen, a professor and head of the social sciences department at West Point. We have Alex Vindman, a DIA candidate here at SICE, and most recently the director for Eastern Europe, the Caucasus, and Russia on the National Security Council. And we have Catherine Wheelbarger, a Rosenblatt visiting fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and the former acting assistant secretary of defense for international security affairs. So thank you for joining. I will moderate a conversation with our speakers for about 30 minutes, and then we will turn to the virtual attendees for questions. You may submit a question through the Zoom Q&A chat function. Um, please submit your name, title, and affiliation with your question, and please also indicate if you are a student, as we will prioritize student questions. And finally, please keep in mind that all conference sessions, including the Q&A portions, are on the record and recorded. So with that, um, there's a lot that we can discuss on the topic of civil military relations at the senior level. So let's just get right into it. My first question is, what impact has the Trump administration had on civil military relations, if any? And what did the Trump administration actually inherit from the Obama administration? Um, and Katie, perhaps we could start with you to get your view from OSD policy during and after Secretary Mattis's tenure. Thank you very much. Let me start by uh, thanking uh, the organizers for inviting me and putting this uh, great panel together and the great conference. I listened uh, yesterday, interestingly, and I think I'll, I'll start by saying much of what I say about my personal experiences uh, will probably reflect or um, uh, sound familiar from what you heard mostly on yesterday's second panel. Uh, a lot of what we heard at potentially a theoretical level I think I experienced or we experienced somewhat um, within government during these years. Um, as background, I spent three years in the Pentagon, but also eight years, almost eight years in Capitol Hill doing largely national security matters for, cap, uh, for committees. And so had uh, interactions on civil military issues there as well. And I would say at, at the start, much of what I think we heard yesterday and what I experienced are there were some things that were sort of uh, specific to the Trump administration or perhaps acute to those years but also we did inherit quite a bit, not just from the Obama administration, but I would say the, the challenges with personnel and bringing civilian leaders into the Pentagon quickly enough really did like, put civilian leadership at a significant disadvantage when it comes to having that appropriate balance between uh, civilian leadership and military leadership. Um, in the particular case of the Trump administration, I think that was largely because there wasn't much of a transition team and so they filling those roles early became very challenging. And of course, we did have a Secretary of Defense who had been most recently a combatant commander and a four-star general. And a lot of what you heard yesterday about the challenges that that brings to bear, uh, we did experience, I would say, firsthand within the Pentagon. Obviously, Secretary Mattis brought a wealth of knowledge and great capabilities to that role, but the transition between what is a very nonpartisan, non-political career to a very political position that sort of requires a public facing explanation of military matters was, um, I would just, I would, I would just saying that was a challenge. 
I wouldn't mind uh, coming in uh, uh, over also on this one. Uh, in terms of impact, it's it seems to me when the key impact is that there is a kind of uh, mythology mystique as, uh, associated with military service, and that that's you know. Uh, a, a drastic departure from previous conflicts that we've been involved in. The U U U.S. is kind of uh, military is one of the most trusted institutions in in the government, and that that continued on through the the Trump administration. And in certain regards, it may be carried forward in a way that's not helpful to civil civil military relations. In that, in a lot of ways, the military was seen as a break, as a guardrail on egregious behavior by the civilian, uh, uh, you know, the, the civilian authorities, the civilian counterparts that are, that have, uh, you know, that, that have the pr principal role in that civil mill relationship within the Pentagon. And I think that's, that's something, unfortunately, some, some damage that we're gonna have to deal with, especially those late, late uh, changes in, at the end of the Trump administration that were by many not seen as cred uh, credible players and the military was seen as kind of the guardrail that had to come out in force and indicate that the uh, that uh, the military would not uh, be uh, politicized and brought into um, you know to to su suppress protests or th things of that nature that is that it in a way undermines you know significant way i think undermines uh, uh, civilian control over the military um, and then maybe you know zooming out to to uh, beyond just the pentagon and uh, civil military inside the pentagon um, there is a there has been a concerted effort to further advance and enable uh, authorities within the Department uh, of Defense to more adequately respond to challenges from near peer adversaries. Uh, some of those uh, there have been authorities that have been devolved. The problem that we have now is based on uh, uh, legitimate and perceived missteps by the Trump administration. There's a buckling down or a desire to buck buckle down on executive functions and ex the executive branch that will uh, in a way uh, be regressive on this idea of enabling decision makers, enabling decision making, granting of authorities, because there'll be some additional scrutiny of the executive branch. So I think uh, there have been some setbacks in those two regards. Perhaps I could just come in briefly. Uh, I, I would like to just start by again thanking the, the conference organizers, uh, Dr. Thornhill, all the student organizers. Um, I also listened last night and I thought it was a really fascinating discussion. Um, I really appreciate the point that Alex just made about, um, about uh, and I think what underpins it actually is the critical importance of, of trust in the, the military decision making process and the reasons uh, the functional reasons for things uh, being done, you know, may not carry uh, across administrations while in an environment that's plagued by lack of trust. I think uh, what I would, well, first of all, let me just say, um, I'm sure that you all assume that this is the case, but I'll be speaking only on my own behalf uh, in this conference, not on behalf of, of the Army or the DOD or any other organization. Uh, but I think what I would say as a generalization would be my concern is I think that there were many phrases to describe the Trump administration, uh, unconventional uh, being one of them that was used quite often. Uh, I think in the realm of civil military relations, it is very difficult to deny the importance of norms, uh, not law, not regulation, not rules, but general guidelines for conduct that sort of preserve the nonpartisan nature of the military and preserve that room for a trust in national security dialogues of, of critical national security importance. And so I, I would say just as a generalization that, that one of the effects of the Trump administration has been uh, a lack of abiding by traditional norms with regard to respecting the fact that publicly uh, the administration should act in its conduct toward the military in a way that does not expect the military to demonstrate uh, partisan identification. And so I think to the extent that that was not true in everything from speeches by members of the administration to military audiences uh, to some more significant national security decision making, I think that's problematic. So building off of norms and guidelines that you just mentioned, Suzanne, it often seems like the president really sets the terms for civil military relations in his or her administration and can decide either to observe civil military norms or not. And is that true? And if so, where are the guardrails? I mean, Alex, you mentioned 
does the military, do military leadership have an obligation to serve as guardrails and protect certain norms or what role does Congress have? I'd love to hear from um, Congress from you, Katie, if possible. Uh, I'll start there with that question since I did serve in Congress for several years. And I think um, uh, Ambassador Edelman hit on this yesterday and Congress has a significant role to play, not only obviously in funding and overseeing uh, the, the Department of Defense and U.S. military operations or train and equip functions, but also in just in how they interact with senior uh, military leaders, particularly whether or not they, uh, members of Congress and senators, approach uh, uh, those senior officers with the understanding of what their role is. And that is not to be the voice of or explainers of administration policy, but actually they are the tools of implementation. And you can see the difference in how, for example, uh, different committees approached oversight functions. Uh, for example, I appeared as assistant secretary at several times um, for combatant reviews, uh, sitting next to my four-star counterparts, whether it be you know, General Votel at CENTCOM or what have you, when I, before the House um, Oversight Committee, the House Armed Services Committee. So to the extent the questions from the members broached on political or policy laden questions or required that sort of answer, I would, even if it was addressed to the, the general sitting with me, I would do my best to answer that question on behalf of the administration because it, it's not the appropriate role for a general officer. Uh, the opposite of that was the Senate Armed Services Committee, which continued its tradition of not having uh, senior um, representatives for a lot of those combatant um, review sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they would have the undersecretary there, but often they would not, which means it's just the opportunity for senators to ask policy questions of, of those senior leaders is always, always present. I would also say we've seen this um, with respect to uh, Secretary Mattis, then General Mattis, and now we're, we're seeing it again with uh, General or Secretary Austin um, is the uh, consistent use of the term general um, when, when referring to those gentlemen, which I think continues what we heard a lot about yesterday was the, the confusion in what their role is. And I just want to add that that's something I experienced internationally that was even probably equally, if not more problematic, is uh, foreign leaders continuing to call Secretary Mattis General Mattis. And after decades spent in the Middle East in particular, you can imagine many of those regimes, we want to send a very stream, a clear message to them that, that there is tight civilian control of the US military. So to have those foreign leaders thinking of uh, our secretary, our senior civilian leader in the Pentagon as a general officer uh, was equally problematic. Sorry, uh, Alex, you're muted. Did, you, did either of you want to touch on that? Sure, I'll jump in on, on this idea of uh, kind of the military potentially serving as guardrails. I, I think it's actually, frankly, uh, uh, not just a purely military issue. I think uh, uh, every public servant at that level swears an oath to uphold, uh, uh, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And it's an obligation that is shared amongst the civilian and uniformed uh, personnel, and both should be fair, uh, serving as guardrails. The propensity to rely on the military comes from the fact that they're seen as apolitical and there are kind of cultural and institutional values that are associated with the military longstanding, especially at that point in your career, you're, you're, you've lived as a military officer for you know, 30, year, 30 plus years in, in most cases. And the expectation is that you will actually adhere to your oath and, and to, to those institutional values. And the, unfortunately the expectation is that other public servants might not do that. That is, um, I hopefully that was uh, isolated and it's not going to be, you know, my, my hope is that was a, a isolated event and a feature of the, the Trump administration, but more than likely that's not going to be the case and you'll have the same kind of skepticism associated with non-uniformed personnel and that's just a, a, an effort, a, a labor uh, that uh, both the military with their um, with their, you know, with their uh, understanding of their subordinate role to the civilian authorities, have to kind of reinforce. Uh, that's their individual responsibility, as well as the, the civilian leadership uh, asserting those rights uh, may, might make headway. Um, tell you the truth, this this conversation about kind of the honorifics, general versus secretary, I've heard it. Uh, I mean. Uh, I maybe just don't understand the issue. I mean, other folks have honorifics. Uh, you know, for instance, Ambassador Bolton, my, my old boss on the NSC, he was the National Security Advisor, but he'd like to be called you know, an ambassador and stuff like that. These are honorifics that are earned and, uh, you know, carry over. Uh, but I could understand that in this perilous time, 
where there's been an erosion uh, uh, in civil military relations, and there's been an erosion in civilian control of the military, why the rhetoric needs to be kind of cons consistent and, and pointed on this issue. Uh, turn it over to my colleagues. Yeah, I, I appreciate both of those points, uh, Alex and, and Katie. I uh, have tended, I, you know, I listened to Dr. Jim Gobi last night, and I, his point about the fact that he had always focused on the military's responsibility in this regard really resonated with me in my own study and scholarship. I have always focused on that as well. And, and part of it is a sense that uh, because military officers are career serving and you have a, a decades to instill in them sort of norms, the culture, the values, the, the, the expectations of behavior that are consistent with a nonpartisan uh, role in a policymaking process that's intrinsically political. All of that, I've tended to focus on, on that aspect of it. But I just want to agree with the panel last night uh, that, that really suggested that that may not be adequate anymore and that we need to be concerned about how we how we uh, instill in our civilian leaders across uh, the interagency within the White House, uh, within Congress, uh, and is there a way of fostering uh, a desire in the American people to expect uh, from their military and from really the civilian leaders as well uh, that, um, that both sides evince respect for the norms that suggest that the military officers are a servant of policymakers and political leaders. Um, and I think last night there was a suggestion that the, the media could play a moderating role. How does the media report on uh, these interactions? Um, so what are, what are the norms as they're understood by the media? But, um, you know, in the first panel last night and not the second, there was an interesting conversation about civic education. And I think in order to have those kinds of expectations among the American people more broadly, uh, what you really need is people that understand the American government and understand what's normal and what's not. Because if you don't start approach these issues with an appreciation for what's normal, uh, then it's more difficult to, um, to call out or to express disapproval uh, for what is not what is not normal. So um, I would like to say that the expect that that the responsibility for affirming those norms needs to be broader than the, the military. And I think there I'm just agreeing with uh, with Alex and 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 Katie. But that um, but how you get there, I think, is a is a tough challenge. So I'd like to move um, to, to what civil military relations actually looks like in practice and how it has manifested in many of the jobs that you all have held. Um, Suzanne, maybe we could start with you. What expectations do both civilian and military advisors bring to the policy making process? And for all of you, to what extent were you actually thinking about civil military rela relations on the job? So I wonder if I might uh, start by uh, suggesting how we might assess what that civil military uh, interaction looks like. And, you know, I think just really quickly, I think you had to, to put out there two standards against which to measure it. First, it, are the interactions democratically appropriate? Do they in events that civilian control, that political control of the military that is a foundation of our system? And then second, does that interaction produce policy that's strategically effective? Whether that's building force structure, whether that's employing the use of force, whether that's using the, the military in a way that supports other uh, forms of policy, does the characteristic of that relationship prom promote strategic effectiveness? So when you approach the, the, the relationship, I think, and you look at the outcomes, those would be the two metrics I think it ought to be measured against. And I, I think I'll just make one more point, which is that, that to me, the critical aspect of that relationship is uh, expectation of dialogue. So I think that um, it's been characterized by different scholars in different ways. You know, Elliot Cohen has talked of the unequal dialogue reflecting the need for the dialogue about political purposes and military means, but also unequal reflecting that the civilians and the, and the political leadership, you know, must, they have the responsibility and the authority to have the final say. Um, I think after, after concerns that Secretary Rumsfeld was a little bit overbearing and there wasn't enough of a dialogue because uh, there wasn't uh, a, a sufficient military information to inform 
uh, things like uh, how the United States approached the war with Iraq, then that got a little bit of a bad name possibly. And, you know, Dick Betts mentioned that maybe what we should think of is, is, uh, is uh, equal dialogue, unequal authority, which reflects this idea that, that there needs to be vigorous give and take and how military instruments of power should be employed to fulfill uh, political purposes. You know, I've myself tried to float this idea of a necessary dialogue uh, but I think uh, it gets at this idea that um, military officers should not walk into a civil military interaction thinking that the political leaders have it all figured out. They will just give them a purpose and then they can go execute, um, nor should they think that they're going to dictate, but they should expect that there to be a lot of dialogue. And then I just think ideally the dialogue is not just leading military figures and the president, but frankly, we just so commonly speak in terms of a whole of a government, the need to employ uh, all instruments of power holistically that 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 dialogue is, is hopefully multi-stakeholder, multi-party, that there's an appreciation that probably successful US policy is gonna involve the successful integration of different instruments of power. I guess I'll jump in and go ahead and answer the question, Marissa, that you had about um, whether it was the question of civil military relations, whether that was a sort of part of our daily jobs. And I'll say in two specific positions that I've held, it, it, it was a, a daily thought, and that is um, serving as policy director on the Senate Armed Services Committee, as well as uh, the acting assistant secretary in DOD. In both of those positions, most prominently um, within the Pentagon, uh, interactions with senior military officers is a daily occurrence. And uh, this is a, uh, this is the challenge we're faced or the balance we're seeking to achieve is obviously situational and very interpersonal. And I don't want anybody to be left with the idea that um, the, the, situ the civil mill dynamics within the Trump administration were, were uh, always negative. Actually, in, in some of my personal experiences, um, given that it was somewhat of a chaotic decision-making environment writ large, that resulted in actually much more robust and cooperative relationships with in particular, my, my joint staff colleagues. So we were sort of, in, in a way, we're sort of in it together. So how can we best explain to our interagency or congressional colleagues the challenges that we're facing and the options um, that we have or that the options that we should be avoiding? Um, and so in, in, many, in many ways, I, we had a very close, tight relationships. Uh, you know, the Pentagon is, if anything, um, adept at ensuring voices are heard um, through the processes. So everything has to be chopped on for the most part by um, both our joint staff colleagues, as well as you know, OSD policy or uh, other aspects of OSD. Um, but, but there were, it was also to the front of our minds because like I said, these, the personnel challenges we faced particularly at the beginning and then as sort of the uh, senior leadership started to change with Secretary Mattis's departure, um, ensuring that uh, the right civilians were in the room while decisions were being made or being discussed uh, was always something that we, we had to, at times, force on the process. Uh, I think one of the challenges of having a former combatant commander become uh, Secretary of Defense is the, uh, uh, at least in, under Secretary Mattis, was a instinct to run the Pentagon somewhat like a COCOM. And that resulted in a, a lot of a former senior officers serving in very senior positions. And it was just, it's, sometimes you had to force what would, would feel like the pro appropriate um, processes uh, into that model to make sure that everybody who needed to be um, in the room was in the room. Yeah, I think uh, from my time on the joint staff before heading over to the White House, I observed the, uh, the same dynamic, but from the from a uniform military perspective. Certainly, I recall uh, when General Mattis uh, assumed the position of secretary, uh, there was a conversation going on about, you know, okay, now, now be, be based on the connections uh, that he had with, a, um, with the chairman and understanding the military that, you know, uh, uh, primacy and preeminence would kind of shift back and forward. It's an unfortunate feature, you know, and almost a, uh, uh, an implicit, uh, uh, un undesired but implicit uh, power struggle in the Pentagon between the joint staff, which is, which is robust. Uh, and um, and OSD, but in that is an anomaly to uh, large swaths of the remainder of my career, especially as a foreign area officer, because I've been stationed forward in country teams where the military footprint is tiny, and uh, you know the clear kind of control uh, and um, direction comes from the political leadership. So that's an easy thing to understand. Uh, um, uh, 
if you have those kinds of experiences, the military doesn't. They're raised within the military hierarchy at the tactical through operational level. At the, only at the strategic level are they exposed to civilian control. And then it's a learning curve to get there. Uh, going back to, to the White House and serving on the National Security Council is a very easy adjustment. Very few military. Nobody wore a uniform. It was all civilian attire. And it was clear what the, uh, the, the chain of control is. So, you know, one of the ways to, to, to crack the code on this is, you know, exposing, I guess, the military in their, um, in their development to civilian control or what that, uh, both concepts in education and, and in practice. So like this, they understand their role is to provide best military advice, be the military advisors to the uh, political decision makers. So we have about four minutes left before we open up to Q&A, and I have two questions um, that refer to some things you've just mentioned, so you can answer whichever you want. Um, Katie, you mentioned that a lot of senior officers were put in senior positions in OSD, um, and I find that in discussions on this topic, we often just focus on the secretary, but from my personal experience in OSD policy, my principal director, my DASD, my ASD were all recently retired veterans. And I think the, stati the statistic is that 47% of civilians serving at DOD are former military. So does it matter that there are former military serving in very, still very senior roles um, in OSD and at the Pentagon? Um, and then also, Alex, because you mentioned the joint staff and how robust they are, um, that's something that I think about the fact that um, the military has the joint staff, they have the COCOMs, so they have a wealth of resources and manpower, and then OSD comparatively has very little. Um, does that imbalance in manpower and resources provide the military with an inherent advantage? Um, and if so, are there structural changes that you think need to be made to balance that? Sure, I'll start. I, I think, um, Again, like a lot of this is interpersonal or it's, it's situational dependent. I, and I, ha I had quite a few um, either former or actually current military serving within the ISA shop uh, while I was there and actually having either current or former service members in, in policy roles served a great function. I mean, they could in many ways help communicate the military perspective or military experiences to other um, OSD civilians who didn't have that kind of background and actually facilitate or help the conversations amongst uh, uh, the uniformed officers and civilians. I think it becomes somewhat problematic at the more senior levels, um, especially if there's a historical uh, relationship between uh, amongst them, particularly with a secretary who is, let's say, bringing in numerous previous generals uh, to serve in very senior civilian capacities that it, the, the balance that you need between civilian perspectives and uh, career military perspectives gets, gets, gets a little um, in, uh, out of balance. And so again, I, I think it's, it can serve a very fruitful role to have veterans serving within uh, civilian positions, but at the senior levels, it's something that I think a secretary should be really cognizant to avoid. Sure. So I, I would think that uh, it's just a question of, frankly, of numbers and uh, the pool, uh, the developmental pool to develop the resident expertise uh, because you have practitioners that have been working the problem from one kind of uniform military perspective. You have a lot, a, a, a skill set that you could rely on uh, for positions. But I, I agree with Katie that uh, at senior echelons, you have a, potentially a smaller pool just by the nature of numbers but you need to make a conscious effort to kind of, uh, you know, develop. Uh, and I think you, you, in a way, I think you actually have that in OSD, a developmental pi pipeline of OSD staff that, you know, three years of experience arises up the, uh, uh, the, the chain there also, or comes over from, you know, because they tend to be at higher levels, politicals comes over from Congress where they have experience working with the military. I don't think the, the solution is necessarily, you know, purely a staffing solution where you, staff greater OSD to kind of achieve parity. Uh, I'm not sure if you need that kind of bureaucracy. Um, you know, I, I'm gonna voice the unpopular vote that it's possible that we, we have uh, staffs that are bloated uh, in certain regards, although uh, we have uh, a, a plethora of, of uh, complex challenges to face and uh, you need people to handle those, but um, you could see you know, where, where that could become an issue. Suzanne, did you wanna comment on that? or we can move to questions. No, I would just say, I, I think there's a, um, 
I think there is potentially a legitimate concern about um, a lack of counterbalance even within the DOD to exercise civilian control. And I would sort of tend to believe, uh, and I don't want to mischaracterize what Katie said, but that I, I do think um, if, if I'm accur accurately summarizing, um, to have a truly civilian perspective uh, provides the possibility of that complementary um, bringing to bear of a variety of considerations, because fundamentally, the use of the military, the amount that we spend on the military, the type of military we build, these are not technical or tactical questions. These are political questions. And so you do need the tactical and technical expertise to sort of uh, make decisions about, to inform the, the understanding of the implications of certain choices. But whether or not the choice is right, whether it's in the best interest of the American people, whether it is in accordance with the administration's policy, those are political judgments. And so uh, I think we need a, a strong layer of, of the, the president's own team uh, in order to ensure that the departments and agencies are run in accordance with the administration's uh, priorities and values. Okay, so we're going to open to questions now. Um, as a reminder, to ask a question, please use the Zoom Q&A chat function, and please state your name, your title, your affiliation, and indicate whether you are a student. And as a reminder, all of this is on the record. So our first question, Katie, it's directed towards you, but please, um, all panelists are welcome to respond to any question. So this question comes from Matthew Donovan. He is a DOD alum and was um, from the Trump administration and was a speaker on last night's panel. And he asks you, Katie, based on your experience in both the Pentagon and on Capitol Hill, how do you see the differences between how the Congress views civil military relations and how the executive branch views them? Specifically, which of those two branches of government take the differences between civilian and military roles in governing with more gravity? Uh, thanks, Matt, for the question. I think um, he, we, he and I actually served together on the SAS, so we probably have a slightly similar perspective, I wouldn't be surprised, which is, even though I came to great awareness on the civil military challenges and the need for appropriate balance and civilian oversight of military activity, while a staffer on the SASC, I did observe that there is um, probably a, a pretty large gulf in understanding between um, sort of the way we would think, we would hope our members of Congress would think about uh, this balance and they actually do. And we've touched on that a little bit already in terms of the um, high likelihood that a, a member is going to ask um, military officers to provide substantive answers to policy and political leading questions. And in fact, they, um, they often do it on purpose for purposes of um, of getting, gaining political points against a position that they're opposed to. I, I think um, not everybody in the executive branch has to um, worry about civil mill relationships every day. I mean, I served in other administrations in uh, less defense capacity, and it wasn't something that was, you know, relevant for the day to day. But when you're talking about those in the executive branch who have to interact, um, there is a, a keen appreciation of the importance of the various roles that I just did not necessarily see when I was working uh, with various principals in, on Capitol Hill. All right, so our next questioner is anonymous and he or she asks uh, you, Suzanne, as an educator of future army leaders, how do you help your students understand civilian control of the military and their rights and responsibilities as officers? How did you discuss incidents such as Lafayette Square with your students? No, I, I appreciate that. I think, um, so, the United States Military Academy uh, works for the Army to develop future Army officers. And though, so from that perspective, we are not a values neutral uh, organization. Uh, everyone uh, who is uh, in uniform or is a federal government employee has sworn to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. So, you know, that is sort of a, uh, a context in which education occurs. Uh, but we do uh, make a strong effort in our American government course that every cadet must take uh, to have a sufficient civil military content such that uh, cadets are introduced to the, to the norms that govern the system and that they're introduced to uh, important de debates that surround those norms. Uh, so, um, you know, I think in general, from an academic perspective, in the classroom, it is about um, 
making sure that cadets appreciate the, the various perspectives out there and have the basis for making critical and evidence-based uh, judgments about them. Um, but again, it, it occurs within an overall context of an institution that um, is preparing officers to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. So, uh, so there, so it, it is, um, it is, we're not completely agnostic uh, with regard to uh, that fundamental set of responsibilities. So I hope that, that that's helpful to you. I actually think that um, if I could just editorialize for a minute, I think actually the, the, the norm of, uh, of a nonpartisan military in some ways rather than closes down our academic environment opens it up uh, in the sense that there's caution about uh, trying to influence one another about our uh, partisan or ideological views and and rather uh, it is about trying to find the important questions trying to think about evidence-based ways of answering those questions and appreciate that what the values are at stake and being willing to explore all those questions in an open academic environment uh, rather than delivering answers. Um, but our, but, um, but I do think issues like that are difficult and they're particularly difficult when uh, as members of the uniformed military, UCMJ uh, commands one not to use disres disrespectful or contemptuous terms toward uh, the commander in chief. So it's a it's a careful, um, but I think uh, that nevertheless the issues can be explored in a conscientious way, and that you know we not only do it but it's our obligation to do it. Uh, so I'm not sure how satisfactory that is, but it is something that we have to be very responsible and trying to do in a professional way uh, that addresses the issues, um, but also helps the cadets to think through them rather than trying to deliver them in answer uh, because. Fundamentally, we're trying to equip them for a lifetime of service and answering different questions than the one that's right in front of us at the, at the moment. Okay, our next question is from Joel Sikulski, a faculty member at the Royal Military College of Canada and a SICE alum. And he asks, does it blur the line between the civilian and military advice provided to the president when active duty military officers hold positions on the National Security Council staff? including in the past the position of national security advisor and this is a question i'd also wanted to ask but we didn't get time we had a very the cabinet was very military heavy at one point with mcmaster and general kelly as a chief of staff so that's the question to anyone who wants to take it you know it's uh, i think this is an interesting topic uh, there have been a, a number of military personnel that have uh, served uh, various echelons on the national security council it's a it's in fact a very flat organization there are directors senior directors and then the national security advisor and and, and deputy so um and we've had in each of those roles we've had uh, military officers uh serve uh, at one point or another since the National Security Council was established, you know, in, in the 40s, um, I think in in certain cases uh, there seems to be little choice as to whether to serve or not. Uh, I, I'm thinking about H.R. McMaster. He, he probably had little choice as to whether to serve on the National Security Council as the National Security Advisor. He's an active duty officer requested by the President of the United States to serve. And, uh, you know, he, he was, he, I guess he could have said no and, and retired and moved on. Uh, that doesn't seem like a likely thing to do. Uh, and I don't necessarily, I, I think if it was a challenge, it was a challenge in uh, interacting with his more senior military counterparts in the Pentagon than it was for, for him to provide kind of uh, not just what he had used, uh, uh, habitually provided up until that point, which was best military advice, uh, but you know a more holistic whole government uh, set of re national security recommendations he could do that you know kind of uh, uh, adjusting his processes and methodologies to get to outcomes but by receiving buy-in from uh, from his four-star counterparts in the Pentagon uh, that was the, the the bigger challenge in certain regards um, and then in terms of kind of lower level uh, national security staffers I, I think it's it's a um, the National Security Council is staffed by three principal agencies. So, you know, you, you have folks coming out of the intel agencies, one pool, State Department is another pool, and DOD is a third pool. And that's you know the, the bulk of the professional staff that comes in at the director level, um, and uh, those are 
you want the perspective of those organizations in in the deliberation and uh, synchronization um, of of national policy because uh, each each one of those pillars comes with their own kind of unique strength and contribution. Um, so I don't think it's 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 you could make the same criticism of folks that maybe come in from the intel community or just uh, uh, I, you, you want you want uh, representation from government in order to uh, address government related issues. Um, we have a great follow up question from Dr. Paula Thornhill. She asks, "What is a civilian? Can veterans ever be considered civilians, or will they always be considered military?" Suzanne, would you like to start on that one? Sign of a good question that I don't have a quick, easy answer for it. Uh, you know, it's it's funny. I do sometimes feel myself. Uh, a little bit alienated by this notion that um, I'm military, therefore I can't uh, see the world as a civilian. Um, I mean, all the people I love most in the world are civilians. So, um, uh, so I, I do think it's an interesting question. And then when you get to uh, a veteran or retired, um, I, I do think it might be worth making a distinction with regard to uh, the seniority of, of an individual in terms of of the inability, I think what we're really talking about is, is politically salient behavior. Um, and so if I were to think in that category, I think that um, the more senior that one was on active duty, the more potential there is that one remar one's remarks may be influential uh, and may be uh, attributed to general beliefs of the military writ large coming from a former senior leader of the military and I think it may be the repercussions are what is the is the the audience's takeaway from listening to that retired uh, flag officer, um, and so you know I think I guess the question would be for what purpose I think with regard to politically salient behavior I do think there's reason for caution for any flag officer uh, to engage in uh, strongly partisan behavior in an extremely public way. I do think it has a potential to redound on the military and to call into question whether or not the military itself either is or ought to be a nonpartisan institution. So perhaps not the perfect answer, but that's, that would be my take. All right, thank you. Um, our next question is from Bobby O'Keefe, a PhD student at American University and an Air Force Colonel. He asks, you've touched on general officers' responsibility to avoid policy issues with domestic policymakers. In combatant commanders in international engagement roles, they often meet with foreign heads of state and senior civilian leaders, um, and they're considering the potential with the potential to be a policy mouthpiece or to be viewed as a political voice. Um, is this practice equally problematic um, internationally as it is in DC? I'll jump in and take that one. It's a great question and actually one of the answers I wanted to give to your question about structural challenges uh, uh, between the military and civilian leadership has to do with uh, the role of combatant, geographic combatant commanders in particular and the size of their staffs. Um, you rightfully highlight that they are um, often in the, their AORs serving as liaisons between the, the command and the administration and our foreign counterparts. And I think it's something every administration needs to be cautious of because um, by nature of their positions, uh, they have the time and uh, capacity to travel much more than their, their civilian counterparts. If you think of uh, my position as ASD for International Security Affairs, uh, there were over there were five combatant commands that where I was responsible for overseeing the def defense policy in those regions. Um, it was impossible for me to visit um, and the senior leaders of those countries as often as each of those four star equivalents could um, could visit. And uh, it's um, it is true that whether consciously or purposely or not some of those interactions can uh, create um, expectation challenges on the part of our partners that can actually box in civilian leaders in terms of their decision making uh, calculations. Uh, there have been conversations that I had um, where a potential decision had been discussed with foreign counterparts 
And the response back to me was, well, we have to make that decision now because they're, they're expecting it before sort of the senior leaders up the Pentagon chain had, had actually been briefed on, on the range of options. Um, this, was this was about a particular force posture decision. Uh, so it, it, that's, uh, it's not infrequent and it's something that's a particular challenge for civilian leaders who are trying to ensure consistent messages across the board because um, in the, the Pentagon and the, the uh, US military is quite a large organization. It's um, hard enough when everybody's talking to each other to make sure that we have the right message. Oftentimes um, there are relationships being built where you don't necessarily have oversight um, or understanding of what the talking points even are. Um, Ed Burnett, a SIS alum, asks, in my experience, OSD had many military officers on rotation. This, that was particularly strange with interactions with joint staff, military OSD officers speaking for civilian leadership to fellow military. Should we have OSD entirely staffed by civilians? I'll jump in there too. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to um, discount the role played by many of my colleagues and those who actually worked for me who were military officers serving in uniform who were um, serving at a senior senior civilian leadership. They did a fabulous job generally across the board, but I also recognize that they were very challenged in um, particularly if they needed to um, disagree with a uh, uniformed officer's opinion when that person outranked them and was in their service, because then it came to the position of, are they going to undermine their future credibility in their own service or potential future options by taking a very strong position, serving in, in a civilian, sort of in a civilian capacity, but, but in uniform. Um, I think that it's probably something we, like uh, Alex said, it's about numbers as well, making sure that, that there's not too much of that in, within the civilian ranks. I think that gets to a broader problem though, is that many of the, often OSD positions are filled by um, military officers because there is such an, a uh, challenge to actually fill those roles by civilians. Uh, given multiple uh, hiring freezes and civilian cuts uh, done both in the Pentagon and, by, and mandated by Congress, and then additional uh, policies and processes that make it very hard to bring in new civilian uh, civilian uh, folks into the OSD uh, that, um, you know, we do have, often have to turn to uh, the services that try, help fill those very important roles uh, to serve the secretary. So I, I do think Congress and the executive branch need to come together to make sure that OSD in particular is appropriately staffed and can retain, can uh, recruit and retain the talent it needs to ensure that the civ mill balance is, is appropriate. Alex, did you want to comment on that? I know you also mentioned earlier that maybe OSD was bloated. Um, is that bloated with um, officers from the military or civilians? I think both staffs are, are quite large and there have been efforts underway to, to uh, trim those back. But frankly, I've been pondering the question that uh, Paula asked uh, and uh, Suzanne asked, uh, answered. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, re-ask that question of my, uh, uh, to myself and hopefully maybe my, my colleagues could uh, uh, chime in. But the responsibilities of a, you know, a military officer or a public servant, uh, both in, in service and after service to live up to their values, uh, sometimes puts, puts that individual uh, in an impossible situation to either kind of speak up and defend those values held uh, uh, those uh, values held most dear and uh, adhered to for, you know, uh, during decades of service or risk, uh, you know, uh, politicizing uh, the enterprise. Uh, so the question is, what do you do? It's an impossible task. One of, them one of the, the consequences is long term and casts uh, a shadow over the, the, the enterprise in the long term. The other one is immediate and potentially uh, has an, uh, a political impact in the short term. No, nobody, I think, would advocate for, you know, active duty military officers uh, or uh, those um, uh, civilian leadership and staff to kind of like, you know, to usurp uh, the authorities of the executive branch, per se. Uh, there are other recourses. Retirement, frankly, is one of them. Resignation. What about, uh, so there's a little bit of a clarity in that path. 
what about uh, senior, uh, senior military officers that have retired? And I know Suzanne uh, made an excellent point about, you know, how that could politicize the force, but what about the, uh, the advocacy for, for uh, values and, and institutional values? Uh, I don't have an answer to that one. It's a tough one. It's a very tough question. Um, an anonymous questioner asks, how do unhealthy civil military relations weaken US national security or undermine strategic effectiveness? Maybe Suzanne, would you like to take that? Sure, sorry, I was fighting with my unmute button there. Um, you know, I do think that uh, you know, as a political scientist, I would say the the concept of trust is squishy and therefore tough to deal with and um, hard to leverage from an analytic or ex explanatory perspective. But you know, I guess it depends on what do, what what are unhealthy uh, civil military relations. You know, what I would take to be uh, healthy civil, civil military relations would be. Um, you know, I guess if I were to share a personal experience, it was I was on the personal staff of General Petraeus in Baghdad during the surge at a time when that conflict was very politically salient. And I think that um, it was marked by really extensive uh, communication between the White House and the theater in which war was, was taking place. And so the flow of information uh, upward and downward, uh, the extensive guidance with weekly NSC civitses, um, secure uh, VTCs. Um, no process uh, metric is gonna guarantee a positive result, but I think uh, a, a positive process makes it uh, more likely that you're going to get that result, or at least the political leaders are going to knowingly uh, accept the risk that they choose to accept in terms of the outcome or accept the cost that they choose to, to accept. So I think, you know, flipping that, I think unhealthy civil military relations would lead to an increase in um, knowledge gaps on both sides, um, military leaders not understanding civilian intent, civilian leaders not being given a good uh, perception from, the, from whatever technical and tactical expertise has to offer of what's possible and the likely costs of that and what's the risks associated with that. Um, so I think uh, that health, the strength of the dialogue to me would be the principal met metric of healthy civil military relations. I just wanna make one more point, I think, because I, I don't think it's often enough made or stated, which is that I would be the first to argue when you're talking about strategic decision-making that a very robust amount of input and civilian leaders, uh, political leaders receptive to hearing that input is absolutely vital such that costs, consequences, options, and risks are really fully understood. But what I don't think is often enough emphasized is that is only technical and tactical information uh, of relatively narrow value and uh, only one among a universe of considerations that the actual political leader has to take into account that may have nothing at all to do with that problem. You know, what is the status of the US budget? What is the state of the US economy? What are the political priorities exist of the administration in the context in which that particular military issue is being debated? So I think healthy civil military relations involves political leaders having access to that information, but it also involves uh, political and military le leaders both understanding the limits of that, how narrow it is, how critical it is, uh, but how much it is not sufficient in providing an ultimate answer. Okay, um, our next uh, questioner is anonymous and asks, is our system of civil military relations an asset or a liability in taking on great power competitors and non-state actor threats? Maybe Alex or Katie, would you like to start off? I'll jump in there and start it off. I think when we're looking at our system of government as a whole in which this, you know, our civil mill um, structure is a part, um, we do face inherent challenges, particularly in, in, res in respect of speed and cohesion of, of government policy when we're faced with authoritarian regimes. That doesn't mean we should sacrifice those values, norms, and structures in order to try to, to compete with those those adversaries or potential adversaries. It's just a recognition that 
within our system of government in which we have checks and balances and a representational democracy, uh, we are not going to be able to operate with the same sort of, uh, again, cohesion and speed that let's say a China can operate with. At the same point, I think we need to make sure that the values that we do have in civil relations is one of them is actually seen as a benefit and in the long-term competition that, are, that, um, that gives us strength and power in, in, that, in that challenge. It's, it's definitely an asset and a liability. And uh, in, in the balance, though, it's uh, uh, a net positive uh, in spite of the fact that it, it could sometimes be laborious and um, might, one might kindly say deliberative uh, or slow, uh, where our adversaries are you know, um, vertically integrated and potentially act quickly. But there is, in fact, um, a, uh, uh, in those systems, oftentimes uh, lacking the consultation uh, enables poor decision making, enables, uh, you know, kind of a more narrow, um, self-serving type of decision making process that's keyed in and geared towards the decision makers' uh, wishes uh, rather than, you know, frankly, all of the, the implications and ramifications that you get from a consultative process. So what, and this is, this gets, gets me back to this kind of point I was making earlier. There are things that we could do to kind of fine tune and hone our system. I think OSD and a joint staff were working on those collaboratively to, uh, you know, delegate authorities, uh, enable more rapid decision making and agility. And we had a setback, I think, because there's uh, less trust in the executive branch potentially, or the concern of overreach. Um, so we, we, and we'll have these types of things in a democracy, especially one that's kind of uh, un, uh, suffering the not um, unusual trials and tribulations of, uh, of, of, of the one we had now, but has also kind of existed in other historical contests in the past. The, the bottom line is that it's served us well. It's, it's key to our culture. Uh, and I think, it, in the, again, in, in aggregate, it's probably better than uh, having this kind of purely vertical uh, uh, decision-making process that has, is prone to probably making some uh, significant errors. All right, so we have just three minutes left. This will be our last question for this panel. Um, Theo Milanopoulos, a PhD student at Columbia, asks, should Congress's law barring recently retired generals from serving as Secretary of Defense be repealed, given that two exemptions have been made in the last four years for Jim Mattis and Lloyd Austin to serve in the position? Is it better to retain a law with exemptions or remove a law when exceptions are becoming the rule? And I'd love to hear from all of you briefly, if possible. Thanks. I'll be real brief. I, I agree with Ambassador Edelman that um, we should be looking for ways where we can actually strengthen the norm that former general officers, recent retired general officers do not serve as Secretary of Defense. And if this particular law is now becoming, where exemptions are becoming the norm, then we should look for other ways to make it a, a challenging decision for the US Congress to make. Yeah, I, I think uh, more broadly um, uh, than, than Theo's question, we should be evaluating, um, you know, the, the erosion of, of the uh, institution uh, that, uh, of the Defense Department over the past four years, figure out what kind of missteps there may have been, uh, had, had the proper military, best military advice filtered up to, um, you know, the, the civilian leadership, did the, the OSD provide kind of the adequate control measures uh, based on, um, you know, uh, how they misaligned with actual law and so forth. Those are the things that we need to be focused on. I think the narrow issue of, uh, you know, Secretary of uh, Defense being military or, or not is secondary to some other challenges that we, uh, we should probably be addressing. And I'll just say, I, I agree with Alex, there are broader issues, but I'm just going to uh, agree with Katie on this. Uh, I thought Ambassador Edelman last night was persuasive and that we should do what we can to buttress the norm, the law, actually, and then the norms that are associated with it. I would like to thank our speakers and attendees for joining us tonight. This has been a fantastic discussion, so thank you all.